I will I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I am, let's see, I, <clears throat> I'm an employee of the County of Marin's Public Works Department. And on, I work a lot on behalf of the Flood Control District um, and specifically Zone 7. The, <clears throat> so the project that we're talking about uh, involves reconstructing the levee that is shown in red here along the main stem of the creek and Santa Margarita Island. Um, and basically shoring up the low points to, uh, to, to bring everything up to a consistent elevation and a consistent level of protection. Um, the, the goal of the project is to achieve the so-called 100 year or uh, base flood level of protection um, and to facilitate future maintenance. Um, facilitating future maintenance is a big aspect of this because the, as this levy was built or as the subdivisions happened in this neighborhood, there no easements were, um, were ever acquired for this levy. And um, so the, the maintenance is sort of, um, you know, sort of ad hoc and it always has been. Um, while the project would, you know, the most visible aspect of the project would be reconstructing the levy, um, the most enduring aspect of the project would be getting easements along the length of it to essentially put the responsibility of the maintenance on the flood control district zone seven into the indefinite future. So this would be a long-term a long-term win for the you know for the flood protection of the neighborhood um, you know and the and the, the viability of Santa Venetia um, under you know under rising sea levels. Um, let's see. So this is a quick overview of the facilities that that the, the dominant facilities in zone seven that are maintained. So um, on the right, you can see the inner levee along the marsh preserve. And that, um, that levee is at about 11 feet. Um, there's a little bit of variation down to like 10 and a half feet and a little bit up to a little bit higher, but um, <clears throat> that is a, good, is a good approximation for the target elevation of the timber reinforced berm that we're shooting for. Um, which the target elevation is 11 feet um, as it currently stands. So um, <clears throat> the, the timber reinforced berm would not be anywhere near that wide or robust um, in terms of mass, but um, and that thing, as you probably know, is like maintained by Marin County Parks as well as some work from the Flood Control District. There's these three bypass pipes um, we call them interceptors are shown in teal, they're the gravity bypass pipes, pump stations and ditches. Um, you all know this stuff. Here's a picture of Russ, <clears throat> courtesy of Marie and IJ. Can, um, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. The, the rule that, um, you know, if you're going to remodel your house, you have to raise it. You know, if you invest too much money, you have to raise it. Is uh -huh. it 10 foot? 10 feet is the the level that they want you to raise it to, right? You know, that sounds right. Yeah. yeah. If you do a substantial remodel, I'm not sure about the exact county code, but usually it's about 50% of the value of the house. Right. Okay. Yeah. Then you raise it to the base flood elevation. Um, and, and that's 10 feet, right? The base flood feet. elevation. Okay. Yeah. I think it's maybe 9.8 or something, but basically 10 feet. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So I, I think I, I'll, I'll talk about that. The elevation stuff a little bit later. Um, here's another picture of the timber reinforced berm. Um, as I'm as I'm adjusting to who's on the call, and I, you know, I, I or on this in this meeting, I, I realize you guys probably all have seen this. Um, but <clears throat> one of our biggest challenges is that it's not a it's not a really visible part of the neighborhood. Most people don't actually see this this piece of infrastructure on a daily basis because it's behind all those homes. So conveying the situation to the people that are in the interior that are protected by it um, <clears throat> and the, the risk and the, just the whole configuration is probably our biggest challenge. Um, in, in, uh, over the course of the last like 10 or 15 years, we've been doing quite a bit of uh, repairs and replacement of individual properties, timber reinforced berms. Um, but this is the current, uh, 
this is this picture is pretty current um, and so this is how it looks in a lot of places it's just an old redwood box um, that at some point might have been called a planter box because it looks like that but we really discourage anybody planting anything in it can I ask uh, another question I'm sorry to keep interrupting no, that's fine. Um, so the easement agreements that you're trying to negotiate would be for maintenance but not public access right just maintenance that's right that's okay. right yeah um, the easement would be <clears throat> a long a 10 foot 10 foot wide centered on this this levy um, just the length of it so right now when we want to do maintenance you know especially if someone that we don't have their phone number we have to like write a letter to them and ask them to get back to us to let us into their side yard to inspect it and there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of administration that just um, you know kind of falls falls through the cracks because it's us pushing and asking and 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 really tr you know just trying to make it happen to do the maintenance where if we just had this easement we could walk the length of it and for instance after a seismic event or a really big flood or even you know or a really big king tide or um you know for any given reason just walk the length of it and see it in a continuous way and see relative changes a lot easier um in in this case like this is taken from uh our pump station two looking looking north or west or um upstream and the in this case the the timber reinforced berm and levee are off the back of the backyard so you can kind of see some fence lines between the trees on the left um, but in a lot of cases the timber reinforced berm goes right between people's yards and um, in houses and stuff and so as part of this project we would rebuild the levee rebuild the berm but then also rebuild fences and gates um, and keep a key like a master key so that we could walk along it but people could still, you know, have have privacy and security and stuff from from their neighbors in the backyard. Um, so my next set of slides is a, is an example of the elevations that we're dealing with. So <clears throat> this this colorful image is um, shows the different elevations um, from a lidar data set that is uh, that is um, post-processed to remove all the buildings and structures. So this is the so-called bare earth or, um, you know, in, in b below houses and places where there's, uh, there's no actual data, it probably interpolates or some, uses some kind of computer algorithm to figure out um, what the probable elevations are down there. Um, but when you zoom in, it's like really, really accurate. I mean, I've compared this to some of our surveys and it's like to the hundredth. Um, <clears throat> and in the key on the left, you can see that um, the, the datum is the NAVD88. The, oops, sorry. Um, so to, I'll point out a couple of things here. So there's the bare earth elevations. Here's the Galenas Creek. The lowest part, I think this is interesting. The, the lowest part of the whole zone seven is the area around La Posada and sort of the center of the butterfly where there's some blue in the neighborhoods. Um, so those are how those are parcels. It's mostly the streets that are, you know, below five feet. Um, and we have mean, let's see, nor, uh, mean higher high water of, I think Fran corrected me on this today, 5.9 feet or something like that. So, um, the teal houses um, are subject, you know, if the levee wasn't there, they would be in the, they would be in the daily, in the daily tidal area. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Have a good dinner. Um, <clears throat> you can also see the heights of the levees. Um, you know, I think that the resolution of the actual timber reinforced berm is you can't really see that you can see basically the levee that's underneath the timber reinforced berm but the post processing probably interpret interpreted a lot of the actual berm as like a some kind of a shed or a structure and removed it <clears throat> but you can see this is this is what's below the trb um you know a lot of a lot of the current condition uh, current crest elevations are in the eight and a half or nine feet um a lot of it's still about ten feet. Um, 
Yeah, we're it's, certainly seeing a lot of little like orange bits seems like showing up, which are the higher elevations just along that line. Yeah, this gives oh. you a sense for how it's been, you know, uh, managed differently in different properties. <clears throat> um, so here's the whole zone seven levy. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So here's some pictures of, of maintenance that we are currently doing. So this is my coworker Benet in the picture. Um, and this is a this is a TRB that we rebuilt last year. Um, and this is what it looks like after we cut down all the ice plant and acacia that was growing there. And you know, you can see that in this case and in quite a few other cases, it's just it's totally decrepit. Um, this is what it looks like after our maintenance work. Um, and I, I use this as an example of approximately what it would look like after our project. Um, the, the proposed construction of the, of the reconstructed timber reinforced berm um, at this point is the, the, the best candidate, the best type of construction that we can imagine um, is not built out of wood anymore. It's built out of a composite material. Um, so that's something that's important to, to convey and you know for your group to understand that um, it's it's you know composite which is like plasticized wood um, is inert and it it's much longer lasting and you know our our structural engineering firm says that this thing can this thing can withhold you know equivalent equivalent forces as a wooden berm um, it would probably need more posts, but it would be essentially the same t configuration, the same type of thing. So <clears throat> the, the posts would be embedded deeper in the ground than they currently are. And the plank, this actually, this picture is sort of terrible in that it doesn't, doesn't show that the planks, so the planks are the, 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 the horizontal, you know, wider boards that are holding the dirt in place. In actuality, they would be embedded deeper into the ground to help do some, some uh, cut off some seepage and maybe reduce some rodents and uh, just provide more of a barrier underneath the ground as well. Um, and then, <clears throat> well, well, as long as it's not soy-based plastic, because they ate my car wiring harness here in Santa Venetia. They love soy plastics. So. Oh, good to know. Okay. Yeah. I'll make a note of that. Um, <clears throat> um, also on the left of this figure, it says polyester reinforcement panel. So <clears throat> what, what we currently do now is um, like what you saw in this, in this deteriorated TRB is that the panels fell apart, like the weight of the soil and um, you know, the, the panels spread open. And so what we currently do is use tie backs like galvanized uh, metal tie backs to hold the front and back panel together um, but polyester reinforcement panel which is like geo grid it's kind of a really tough plastic plastic mesh that is often used for a uh, you know for like um, holding soil back basically um, it can also be used in this fashion to hold the hold to hold the front and back panels together and would be a barrier for for burrowing rodents and uh, oops. <clears throat> so those are some of the differences between the, the you know the proposed construction and the current and the current TRB um, an alternative that is being considered and we would we would allow we probably we don't have enough money to do this along the whole length nor would we want to but this is our so-called alternative for parcels where either the backyard needs fill or has already gotten a lot of fill and just needs some kind of um, some buttressing from from the creek side so these MSE blocks are stacked and interlocking and then polyester reinforcement panels are buried into the ground to hold them back um, from from collapsing into the creek over time and then it's the it's this MSE blocks I think it stands for mechanically stabilized earth. Um, <clears throat> this is, this came out of some other alternative designs that were done over the last several years where there was like a single, maybe a single wooden wall with a buried 
anchor, like a tie back. Um, and that idea seems to work, but the tie back has to go pretty far into the person's yard and it's a piece of metal that could fall apart. So this is, this is the new version of this alternative design. Um, one of our former advisory board members, I want to say his name is Evan Marks, did this. And there's a few other people um, in, in along, the, along the reach, um, a few other home, homes and properties where this would be a good candidate. Um, so those are the two big, those are the two big alternatives. These two, these two proposed constructions that I've shown you um, are, are really appealing because they, you know, if our, if our foundation is strong, they can be, they can be raised like we have, like the current TRB has been raised over time. Like these two can also be raised over time if we see sea level if we see sea level rise rates accelerating in the next 10, 15, 20 years, um, you know, or, or, you know, we get to the end of the service life of the project, which is expected to be 30 years, and we don't have another plan, and, um, you know, this, this, this is, uh, it provides some alternatives, and um, that, that gets at the need to balance, um, you know these conflicting these conflicting desires of maintaining views for the homeowners along there and maintaining access over the TRB. So keeping the height as low as possible, while also ac accommodating the the variability and the risk and uh, you know meeting our 10 foot FEMA base flood elevation needs and having freeboard above that to accommodate for subsidence over time. So um, this this. Uh, the, f the flexibility offered in these two designs is, uh, I think, an important aspect of it. Some of the progress that's happened on this project is last year we completed the initial study um, for CEQA, which is um, it was it was quite it was quite an endeavor, and it's a pretty big document. The initial study is available on the pro on the project website, <clears throat> and it describes. Uh, what was our best guess of the environmental impacts of the project uh, based on the sort of this sort of generalized design that we have um, it looks at you know things like air quality and traffic and you know the impacts of views and stuff i think the the what's what's probably most of most interest to this group is the biological resources and and the um the way that we are planning on protecting the marsh, basically, which is so close to the project. So um, I'm going to go back up to this picture here to, sh to give a sense for what we're dealing with. Um, <clears throat> the you know the initial study and the general the general plan would be to uh, the, the the initial study says that we will restore with native vegetation. Um, and provide some provide some connectivity for animals that need to get to that need to escape from really high tides. This is high tide refugia for basically the salt marsh harvest mouse, um, a, a, an endangered species. So <clears throat> we'll be we'll be the the way that the best way that we can imagine to do that is to do some planting on the outboard side um, of the type of vegetation that gets kind of bushy and gives the mouse something to grab onto to get over the levee. Um, this is kind of black box science for me because the mice come out at night. I don't really know exactly how they behave. I believe that um, there's some the, some mouse studies going on as part of the McGinnis Marsh Restoration Project. Um, and at some point, we'll definitely need to consult with the agencies to figure out how to best protect the mice. Um, and the, the Ridgeways rail and, and all the other species that inhabit the marsh. Um, we probably will have to do this with biological monitors on site um, and, and maybe stagger construction to avoid any kind of nests and stuff so that we can work beyond the species work windows. <clears throat> the species work windows are, you know, like I think a month, you know, a month and a half in the fall or something like that. And, and so if we have a biologist on site who's actively watching and protecting um, the temporary construction impacts, that, that will allow us to, to work throughout the year. Um, 
oops, jumping ahead here. That is, <clears throat> that's down here at the, um, the regulatory permits. So we, we haven't, we, we've informally consulted with agencies, but we don't know exactly what the requirements will be for protecting the mice or even like this, the species um, of plants that will need to be planted or, you know, all those details will still be worked out. It's kind of explained in general terms in the, in the initial study. FEMA awarded a $3 million grant for the project uh, this year, early this year. Um, <clears throat> and so that generates about half of the project funding. <clears throat> it's, it's like a, it's a huge, it's a huge, huge amount of money. This is a $6 million project. Um, FEMA HMGP is a hazard mitigation grant program fund. Um, these grants are always for $3 million. We probably would have asked for six if we could have, but it's just, that's how, that's how these grants get structured is $3 million for um, a $4 million project. And that's a 75% match. So um, the, basically the easement acquisition process and a lot of, you know, $2 million of the project are not included in the FEMA grant. Um, that's, that's why we need to pass a tax measure and this tax measure, I'll, I'll get into that in a second. Um, survey and engineering work is in progress. So um, <clears throat> we, we are working on, um, this has also long been talked about, a, a demonstration project. So we think we have a good, a good location lined up where we could build an example of this um, new new style TRB of composite material and even do the planting and see how it looks and see how it works and see how it feels. Um, and then people could, you know, we could learn from, learn from trying it once, but people could also see it. Um, and hopefully that would happen before um, the benefit assessment vote, which is the new, the new term for the tax. Um, so I, I, um, Yeah, so I, <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the details of the benefit assessment um, because we're still figuring that, that out. Basic, but I'll, I'll just sort of talk generally about what this is and how we came to it. Um, uh, I think it was last August or September, we had our last advisory board meeting, um, Flood Zone 7 advisory board meeting, um, <clears throat> where we talked. And then there was, there was even one before that where we like, talked a lot about the tax. I mean, the flood district has um, a pretty bad track record of, of passing these kinds of special parcel taxes, but that what was, that's what was being proposed was a special parcel tax of a flat amount across the whole zone. And um, there was questions about the equity and you know, who, who, you know, who benefits or is there a low income senior exemption or, um, <clears throat> a lot uh, like I, what I got out of those meetings, my takeaway was that we should try to make a smaller zone that is just focused on protecting the houses in the flood zone. So down here in the FEMA flood zone, um, the houses in blue on this figure are basically, yeah, that, that is, that's the FEMA special flood hazard area or flood zone. <clears throat> and you know, a special parcel tax requires two thirds majority. And, you know, I just think that the people up on the hill would not be voting for it. And I was like, well, how do we, how do we reconfigure a parcel tax so that it, so that it's, you know, so that it's being paid for and only voted on by the people that are in the special flood hazard area, because that's who is protecting, which led us to this idea of a benefit assessment. And <clears throat> a benefit assessment is something that um, it's a it's a method of um, it's it's a method of paying for this kind of this kind of project or this or or a certain service where the benefit can be quantified where it you know this doesn't work for this this wouldn't work for a you know some of the past proposals the parcel tax proposals that have been floated that would you know, pay for some of this project and some of this maintenance and some of this person's time and, you know, outreach for, you know, 
uh, habitat enhancements and stuff. A benefit assessment is for something that has a really specific benefit to a specific parcel. And in this case, we have that because we have, we have a, a target elevation of protection. We have, you know, we have risk models. We have, we know who's in, who's out. And, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of calculating the, the, the depth and damage and demonstrating what the benefit is. Um, <clears throat> the benefit, let's see, let me read my notes here. Um, so it's, it's quantified and assigned to parcels in an engineering report. And that <clears throat> is something that we're developing right now. Um, this, you know, this would, this would pass, have a more um, favorable outcome if you were able to somehow tie it to that, that planning rule where you have to raise your house to 10 feet elevation if you invest money in it. Because why would we be paying into a parcel tax or a benefit assessment to protect ourselves, but yet we still have to raise our houses if we put money into our house? Yeah. I mean, maybe there should, could be some exemption to that rule and then more people would vote for this. Yeah. I'd rather pay an annual fee for that protection than $300,000 to raise my house. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, that's being considered. And I don't, <clears throat> thanks for that input. That's, that's great. I, I don't want to get into what we're considering right now because when I, when I, when, when we can get a draft of the engineering report out to the advisory board, then we can have a bunch of conversations about it. But <clears throat> I am, I'm considering including something like that. Um, <clears throat> well, you'd have my vote if there was an <laughs> exemption to that planning requirement. <laughs> when, just to give you a sense for what $1 million looks like across these 650 homes, like um, it's, well, I'm, I won't even go there with the numbers, but the, the a benefit, like generally speaking, the lower houses or the people that benefit more, they would they would pay more in the benefit, but their votes would also count more. So it's a whole different type of, it's a whole different type of structure. Um, also, you can pay a lump sum. So you could, you know, pay your X amount of money or all at once, or it can go into your, into your, it can go, we can give that information to the county tax uh, a collector and pay, you know, a, a lesser amount over a longer amount of time. Um, Gerhard, I have a question then too. I know a lot of people were concerned about flood insurance or whatnot. If you've raised the levy with this particularly structured berm, does uh -huh. that lessen people's FEMA flood insurance costs or things like that? Do they get to escape from well, that? There's no, no, at this point, there's no escape from that. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. The, <clears throat> the criteria for removing the houses from the special flood hazard area is an accredited levy to FEMA or Army Corps standards, which requires um, like a, a much more robust levy with a, with a lot of land, like a 15 foot setback on either side with no vegetation. Um, so <clears throat> the short answer is not in the immediate, but, I, but in the long term, definitely, because there's a few different ways that this, that this could reduce the flood insurance rates. First is, there's a program through FEMA called the Levy Assistance and Mapping Program that is designed to give partial credit for these kinds of levies that don't meet the accreditation criteria. <clears throat> so we'll be trying to do that. We'll be trying to get partial credit. Um, but also in a, in a climate where flood insurance rates are really going up right now, this, I, I think, you know, and this all happens, you know, how, 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 flood insurance premiums are calculated is really beyond me. But this kind of project would, especially if it's preventing, if preventing floods that would otherwise happen, will prevent those rates from rising as fast or maybe even keep them at a current level. Um, <clears throat> the more stuff about how benefit assessments work is, so even though we're targeting October, November, this is not the presidential, general election this is this is a it's voted on by people that are affected by the benefit or that would pay into the assessment so um, it, that doesn't align that doesn't align with a uh, 
you know, with a with a voting with a voting tract, um, and so it this happens. There's a board of supervisors meeting that would accept the engineer's report that says, oh yeah, this is a good, you know, this this. Yeah, yeah, like yes, go forward. This is a good methodology for calculating the, the benefits. And then we mail the, the ballots. They um, then there's a 45 day waiting period, and then another board of supervisors hearing where the ballots are opened and counted. I think it's done in public. I'm not sure exactly about the details, but um, with you know this number of houses, I think that could probably be done. Um, <clears throat> and yeah. <clears throat> um I, the the flood the flood district the flood district did benefit assessments a long long time ago this was done um in zone one in novato i don't know maybe in the 80s but then somehow like institutionally forgot how to do them um and so the the process that we're going through right now of developing the engineer's report and you know br we'll bring this to the advisory board um that is being paid for by the watershed program so that's the county of marin that's that's paying this you know relatively small amount of money to figure out how to do the invest how to do the uh the engineers report the engineers report and the whole benefit assessment process even how to how to manage it if it passes like every year you know there's a little bit of administration um but there were some i got some questions um about you know shouldn't the advisory board have have voted on this going forward and the answer is that we the 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 watershed program and zone staff we need to figure out what we're talking about so that we can present it to the zone seven advisory board so that's what we're doing is like putting this methodology together and having somebody help us figure out how to do a benefit assessment and then before the first board of supervisors meeting we'll have an advisory board meeting um, where the advisory board members can talk about it in an open forum and um, yeah and hopefully recommend that it goes forward um, it, it you know I'm going to try to continue to tailor it to um, to the previous recommendations of the advisory board and things that we've heard in terms of um, you know focusing it on people that are at the most that or properties that have the biggest flood risk maybe with exemptions or discounts for elevated homes or something like that. But, um, <clears throat> but just keep, keep, yeah, keep fashioning it in a way that's really similar to what we have talked about in the past at the parcel tax. So I don't want this to feel like a, you know, a bait and switch or some kind of a last minute change. This is really a different word for, you know, a slightly different configuration of the parcel tax. Um, it, it sounds really complex with a lot of different moving pieces, but um, hopefully this will this will work out better for everyone. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, are you ready for questions, Gerhard? And um, I am. I'm or is there a little up. bit more that you wanted to say? I, I didn't want to. More photos that I thought you know this is kind of perfunctory, but I, I would okay. be remiss without mentioning that part of the project also involves replacing or or not replacing, but um, strengthening some outfall pipes that are going through the levee. So this is not just rebuilding the levee, but um, addressing some of the weaknesses. Um, this is the outfall for pump station two, which is an old corrugated metal pipe, probably from the 60s, and it just needs a slip line, which is a way of cleaning and, and drying out the inside and then spin casting concrete against the inside of it to structurally reinforce it. Mm -hmm. um, and then here at pump station five, this is the view from that north end of the marsh preserve loop um, there's a there's an abandoned pipe that you can see that little corrugated metal thing right down at the water line oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that thing needs to come out and just be be removed so that it's not you know it has tide water going through it up into the neighborhood so um, that is also technically part of the project but a pretty minor part um, okay oh well, thank you thank you again Gerhard for bringing all that to us um, so we're going to open it up for questions.